Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening. I'm Carolyn Ducey, Curator of Collections, and I, I feel a little overwhelmed and a, a little emotional tonight. Um, not very often that you get to have a show dedicated to your, what you love and, and be indulged in this way. Um, I am celebrating 20 years here at the, the International Quilt Study Center Museum. I think we have a few volunteers on our our staff that uh, have actually been here a little longer than I am. The um, volunteers started when the, the truck rolled up with the James Cook collection back in 1997, and I arrived about a month later. So I know Beth Cunningham, that's here tonight. Sometimes she's here. I know she started before I did. Anyway, so I'm not really the senior employee here in the museum, but I am. So um, when we were talking about our birthdays, this is our 10th anniversary of the building being built, our 20th anniversary of the center, all of these things on um, Leslie Levy, our executive director, said, you know, I think you should do a show. You should do a show and show your favorite quilts and, and celebrate your 20th anniversary. And I kind of thought, no, I don't know. But it was just such a lovely idea, and I got really excited at the thought of it, knowing full well that picking my favorites and narrowing it down to 13 or so quilts was going to be pretty impossible. I and mean, it was a lot harder than I even imagined because I started going through the collection and you know, it, it's like your kids. You go, oh, that's my favorite. No, that's my favorite. Well, today, this is my favorite. And it just went on and on. So I had a, an enormous list of quotes that I had picked out as I searched through our database and printed that off and started looking at those. And um, then, of course, we always have to look at how often the quilt has been exhibited because we have a 12-month limit quilt every 10 years as part of our conservation, preventative conservation. So once I looked at how often these quilts had been shown, that eliminated about 99% of my list. So, oh no, now what do I do? Now I, I have plenty to work with. But then after that I realized I kind of wanted to take a different approach to this show. So what I did was to kind of go back and, and instead of thinking about my favorite quilts so much, I started thinking about my favorite people, my favorite experiences as a curator here, and some of the things that I was most proud of. And so that's what really led to the day exhibit that you see tonight here in the galleries. And what I thought we'd do tonight is just, I'll give you a kind of an overview, talk a little bit, but then I think it'd be really fun to go in the galleries and then talk more in there. So we'll keep it kind of short out here. Um, I think it was so sweet too before I get too far um, into my talk that how much of my fellow staff members know me. They have my, my favorite frosted sugar cookies here tonight, mm -hmm. my absolute favorite in the world. And if you notice the exhibition, um, this is my favorite shirt, which I wore particular today because when they designed the gallery, I don't know, Anasana and Jonathan and Lydia's not here, so our exhibits crews here. I don't remember if we had this discussion. I think they picked that color because they know this is my favorite shirt. So when you look at the exhibit, the highlight color is the color of my favorite blouse. So that was so cool that they, they know these things about me and know me so well. So anyway, so um, once I started thinking about the, the collection in a different way, and thinking about just how we have grown over 20 years, from the 1,000 quilts that we started with in 1997 to probably close to 6,000 quilts now, it was just such an amazing thing to think about those wonderful experiences I've had. So I really focused a lot of the exhibition on some of our largest collections and the memories I had of those collectors traveling in their home, working with the quilts, and just kind of that, that, the impressions and feelings that I had. So I don't really want to repeat the label information because I know you're all going to go and read every single gem that I wrote, but I'll give you an overview anyway. Um, so I started, of course, with the James family, and getting to know Robert and Arch James was just an amazing thing. You know, I'm, when I first started, I, this is literally my first professional position. I was really green. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I was really fortunate to get hired on as the first curator. And very soon after that, I made one of my first trips to the James's home in Chappaqua, New York. And they had built onto their home, above their garage, a, a space for the quilt collection. So they actually expanded the garage, built this staircase up to this room where they had four king size bed frames, or bed frames with just a, a board across the top of them, and then quilts stacked 200 deep on each one of these bed frames. And so it was just an amazing thing to walk into the quilt room, as they call it, and to see these enormous stacks of quilts. 
But that was, you know, that, that was why the Jameses really needed to find a home for them, because if they needed to find a quilt, you can imagine the one they needed was always at the bottom of the stack. And you can't even, after you get through about 100 quilts, you, you're folding them back, you're folding back to corner to find the one you want. And pretty soon you've got like this much of the quilt showing, and it's harder and harder to see what you're doing. And it's just, it's difficult for them to really make the collection as, um, accessible and used as they wanted it to be. And the James has always had that goal for this collection that it was a study collection that would be available for people to use, to study, to borrow. So with that goal in mind, they, they really felt that, that we were better situated and, and able to handle the, the collection in a better way than they could. And of course, with our high density storage, temperature and humidity controls, we've really been able to take a lot of great preventative steps so 20 years in, I think our collection is looking pretty good. Um, it's interesting that I have uh, pieces at home that have not been kept in the proper temperature and storage, and to see what's happened with those little pieces. Um, talk to me about fusibles. If you like fusibles, I'm telling you, I can tell you what's coming 20 years down the line, you know. Um, my sisters and I went through a stage where we made lots and lots of fused little wall hangings. In fact, I found my Halloween ones looking for some things this week, and, one of my Halloween projects, the, the little witch I stuck to that background, has now popped off. It's very, very stiff, and it's like the perfect little yellow shape of that witch on the background. These holes are not a good thing. Another story. Um, so anyway, so, so going to the James's home was always amazing. They lived in Chappaqua, New York. They lived in an area that was really heavily wooded. I remember getting up in the morning to get an early flight, leaving from their house, and there would be deer out in the front yard. It was very, you know, a, an hour and a half outside of New York City, but it was still very, um, very rural, very forested. It was a beautiful area. And when we would come to, to visit Bob, the artist, Bob would always be so excited to have us there that we would start with the toast, and he would get out maybe a bottle of champagne, and sometimes he would get out a really old bottle of port, which, uh, Never stand to taste that port, and I, the bottle looked like it had been there since man first first discovered the world. I don't know. It was an old bottle of port, so I was always really happy when we popped a bottle of champagne instead. So it would be three o'clock in the afternoon, and we'd be toasting and, and talking about what we planned to do, and just catching up all of our information. Artist James always sat in the corner of the room in her dental chair. She had an antique dentist chair that was her spot. As my mom used to always say, her stall. She would always sit there, her reading line was there, all this information out on the coffee table. The table was always covered with magazines and newspapers and information. Artists were just a voracious reader. And she would sit down and we would you know, fill her in on all the different things that we had happening. And I'm going to go upstairs and just be blown away by these amazing quilts that we'd see at their house. Um, what I, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of is that the Jameses have given quilts to us three different times. So they started with the 1,000 or so quilts that kind of were the nucleus of our collection. And then they still collected. After they emptied that room, they evidently felt compelled to fill it again. So um, in 2006, we received about, about 250 to 300 quilts from them because they were getting that room was filling up again and they wanted us to take over those quilts. And then finally, in 2009, when they were beginning to think about leaving their home, they gave us about the last 60 quilts that were really, really special to them. So the quilt in the exhibition that you see is kind of a, a target quilt. Every time I went to the James's, that quilt was on the wall in the quilt room. It was something that artists loved, she loved seeing, and so it always brings back that memory of going to the quilt room and, and visiting with the James's. Um, the next group that, that I represented in the collection with one of my favorites is um, the African American collection of Robert Cargo. And we acquired that in 2000, and that's about 100, almost 155 African American quilts. And when we started with the museum, we were still dealing with a lot of myths of the quilt world. There were a lot of, you know, that was the time when, gosh, we looked really hard at the quilt was a machine quilt. It was like, oh, I don't know. You know, we, we like our traditional hand quilted quilts. Now, that has just gone so, that, that change is so radically different from when I started. Um, the, one of the other myths that we often heard, and, and people would bring in quilts and talk about, was that you could tell an African American quilt by the technique and the, the skill of the maker. So if you found a quilt that wasn't 
put together particularly well, or it was put together with a lot of scrappy quotes. People would often say, I think this is an African American quote. And um, many of you know our director, our, our founding director, Patricia Cruz. Um, Pat is a scientist. And one of the best lessons that I learned from Pat was she would say, well, how do you know that? How do you know that you know that? And she would really question it. And she would constantly be working to make us think outside those cliches and those myths that we had. So when the Cargo Collection was presented to us, it was particularly important because Robert Cargo collected the quilts directly from the makers. He had names of makers associated with those quilts. And as far as I know, um, some of Robert Cargo's collection is at the um, University, uh, Birmingham University of Art, Birmingham U Museum of Art. I'm, I'm mangling that name. But anyway, so the, the University in Birmingham has some of Robert's collection. But I don't think that there are many African American collections that exist that are as well documented as the Cargo collection. So that was a really important addition to our collection and kind of really spelled out the direction we were going to go with our acquisitions. Because with Pat as our, as our guiding force, if we were going to add a quote to the collection, she wanted to see the provenance. She wanted to know what we knew. What was that quote we could add to the collection? And it was really a good exercise, really, because we would have to write a statement. And we being me and our acquisition coordinators, who we've had a couple through the years, you would have to write a statement of significance. Why is this piece important for the collection? What is it adding to the collection? And that memory always stayed with me. That you know, what do we really know versus what do we think we know? And in the quote world, that still is a, is a real issue today. And that's why you see things on our labels like possibly, probably, circa. You're very, very careful to not assign any information as fact unless we know it as fact. And of course, when we're adding to the collection, the first thing we ask is, what do you know about this book? Do you know who made it? Do you know when it was made? You know, who made it? Um, so those, that information was something that Pat was just really committed to from day one. And I, I think it was the scientist in her. She could definitely be blown away by a beautiful quote like we all could. And sometimes that is what is significant about a quote, is it's just such a spectacular example of what it is. Or, or maybe it's a very simple example of a very functional piece. So there were all these considerations, but the Pat was an amazing mentor over the about the first 15 years I worked here at the museum and over in the Home Economics Department, the Home Economics Building in the Textile Merchandising and Fashion Design Department, and that is our, our overarching organization. We are a part of that department. So the cargo collection was really significant for us. The next major collection that we really um, looked at was the Holstein collection. And Jonathan Holstein was an, an amazing writer, published author, amazing collector. Um, to go to his home in Casanova, New York, um, was astounding. He was in a home his family has owned for years. It, it, it's the architect design home built in. It looks kind of like a Frank Lloyd Wright house. And then, of course, there's the, the lake house down the hill by the lake. And, it was just, I, I literally would have just been like, I cannot believe Carolyn from Nebraska is here. You know, I mean, it was really what those kind of situations that I kept finding myself in and I was just so amazed by. Um, and Jonathan Holstein, the very first time we went there, we went just to kind of scope out his collection and see what we thought, you know. We didn't think we needed the whole collection. That's another story. Jonathan uh, made that happen. Like, he makes so many things happen. Um, he's a tease and he's a character. Love him dearly, he's become a dear friend. Um, we, we talk on the phone probably three times a week because he's always had ideas or, or he's found a great quilt or he's got something he needs to talk about. And I, I just adore Jonathan. But that first time we went to his home, we sat down in his living room and his house is full of art, all these beautiful pieces, and there were stones on the coffee table. And he said, Oh, I'm thinking about buying these. These are prehistoric tools, stone tools. He said, yeah, take a look at it. So I picked this piece up, and it's a stone just, just with the ever so slightly shaped, just to fit your hand so that you could use it, or we got it, to mash things maybe. But it was just the most beautiful piece. And so I literally was just like, I can't believe I'm sitting here in Jonathan Holstein's living room with a prehistoric tool in my hand. It doesn't get any better than this. And, but it, 
kept getting better all the time. Um, so we, we looked at Jonathan Holstein's collection really closely. Ultimately, we worked with the James family and acquired over 300 of Jonathan Holstein's quilts. And with that group came two particular groups that are really significant in our collection. One is 60 quilts from an exhibition that was held in 1971 at the Whitney Museum of Art in New York City. It was called Abstract Design in American Quilts. And it was one of the first times that quilts were shown in a museum as artwork. It was fairly controversial because Jonathan didn't talk about makers. And he didn't talk about the women who made the quilts. He just showed them as art, as design elements. And the controversy was pretty astounding because he actually had a quilt that he showed in the gallery that had a woman's name stitched on it and he put it on, I think it was either upside down or sideways. He completely disregarded that for the form in the quilt. But regardless, that was an enormous, influential exhibition that everyone has, has written about. And every time you write about quilt history, especially since the 1970s, you talk about abstract design in American quilts. So, I really wanted that group, and I wanted to see that that group got kept together forever. The next group from Jonathan work is Amish quilts. And I still remember when I, I worked for the Kirk Collection in Omaha as an undergrad student, and um, I still remember the first Amish quilt, the real Amish quilt I saw. Someone brought one into the shop one day, and I was just like, that's a real Amish quilt. I mean, it, was, it was thrilling. Um, and then to go to Jonathan Holstein's, where he had over a hundred of these beautiful Lancaster, Pennsylvania Amish quilts was astounding. And we just saw one after another as we packed up these quilts. Um, that Amish collection added to Midwestern Amish quilts from the James collection, ultimately the Sarah Miller collection of Amish crib quilts, Canadian Amish quilts, Mifflin County Amish quilts. We have tried to gather the most broad and substantial Amish collection in the world here at the museum. And that is, is, is really exciting and really thrilling to be able to say that we have another collection like that that is so significant. Um, many of you may know Sarah Dillow. Um, Sarah was a, a dear friend and her collection came to us in 2008. Um, and it, it, I, I did our volunteer walk through this morning and it's really heartbreaking because Sarah Dillow was one of the, the people who was with us from day one. She was the person that Bob James went to at an American Quilt Study Group meeting. Some of the, their um, seminars are in different cities every year. So I don't even know what city it was in. And they said, hey, do you know this Pat Cruz who wrote this book, Nebraska Quilts and Quilt Makers? We need to talk to her about our collection. Of course, Sarah knew that book. Sarah knew Pat. Um, so Sarah was the person who introduced Pat Cruz to the James, the Jameses and really began this whole process. And she had been committed to our success from day one. Um, she and her husband, Byron, um, gave us funding to build the Byron and Sarah Rose Yellow Conservation Work Room on the first floor. Um, Sarah liked to joke that Byron was very conservative, so the conservation work room was perfect for him to put his name on. So, um, so she, she was involved in the building plans and the acquisition plans. And right up until she was actually here in the building um, as it was being built, I had her hard hat with her name on it in my office. But she died before the building was completed. So she never saw the actual museum. She never saw a quilt painting in the museum, which was really a sad situation. And you know, she lost her husband, Byron, just a few years earlier, both of them very unexpectedly, very quickly. And it was really heartbreaking. Um, Sarah was our first acquisitions coordinator. And I loved working with her. Um, I like to tell the story when I first met Sarah, she was like, she's big, she's a big person here at the museum, and I was brand new, and I would be standing across the room thinking, she's gonna get to know me and she's gonna love me because we love the same things. And I was like, I made it a point I was going to be Sarah's friend, close friend. She just didn't know it. But of course we did discover that we both loved it. We loved early fabrics, especially, we loved early quilts. Um, and I was thrilled when we um, actually hired Sarah to be our acquisition coordinator because Bob James trusted Sarah. He didn't trust me yet. I was a little too green still. I wasn't sure if I knew what I was doing, but Sarah and I would work together behind the scenes. I'll tell you this now and spread it on you. Uh, we would plot out what quilts we thought that we could put before the acquisition committee to purchase. And this was still, this was before the 2008 you know, economic meltdown. 
Bob James was like ready to make this collection grow, so Sarah would come up with a list of pieces that she thought we should have, and Bob would say, Sarah, if you think that's what we need, then okay. And he would just say, okay. So during the 2004, 2005 period, the collection grew like incredibly, not by just sheer numbers, but just by the sheer quality of the quotes and the fact that we were buying really early quotes, which for us meant anything pre-1850. And you know, Bob knew he and he and um, artists had not collected in that time period really thoroughly. So he had a lot of growing to do, but it was astounding because I'd say, Sarah, oh, I love this piece. This is so cool. It's really expensive. I don't I don't think we're gonna be able to get it. And she'd say, Well, you know, let me let me look at it. And next thing you know, she'd call me up and she'd say, Well, I think it's okay to get that piece. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's there's one that we saw in um New York City at, um, I'm sorry, I can't think of the girl, like, um, T. D. Holly runs a shop called Cora Ginsburg Incorporated. Cora Ginsburg was one of the really early textile collectors, and she has an amazing shop in New York City, and you should go whether you can afford the thing in it because it's such a beautiful shop. But um, we went in and we saw this amazing English embroidered piece. It was mounted. It was so expensive, and I was just like, you know, we, we couldn't even really get it shipped, it was so expensive, this, this, this. I was just like, way we're going to get that, but I just think we really need to have it, because it was, you know, like the, the early stuff. I mean, I could think of a million reasons why we needed to have that piece. And sure enough, you know, like the next day, she said, well, you know, T said she'll take it off the brain so she can ship it to us, and she's sending it, it'll be here in a couple days. It was so much fun, because Sarah was just that way. She, she just had Bob's confidence, and so the collection grew just amazingly. Um, so in the exhibition, you'll see uh, two pieces. One is from Sarah's collection. It was also one of the quotes that was the centerpiece of my dissertation research. Um, the, the Anne Reese quilt, which is a chintz applique. A chintz applique is something I have adored since I started here. Fell in love with it, looking at quilts um, from the James collection. And then next to it is an early quote from the Netherlands. And it has the most beautiful fabric you've ever seen. And that's why I paired those two together, because First of all, you just don't see quilts come out of the Netherlands very often at all. That's a rare thing for us to find. We have two quilts from that area of the world, and the fabrics are about 1800, 1810, and they are luscious. They are so beautiful. And I think it really is kind of the heyday of textile printing, because from then on, it was just a push to do it faster and cheaper. And I think the quality just eventually kind of went down because they were mass producing the textiles. So that's my little tribute to the, the Dillow collection in Sarah Dillow. And I think that uh, the other, um, we acquired the Gormley collection as well that year, the Gormley collection of doll quilts. Um, more than 300 quilts from Mary Gormley, and her collection was amazing. We had shown it before um, in an exhibition. We had occasionally put doll quilts in other exhibitions, and they just always stole the show. People could not resist Mary's quilts. And she had such great stories. You know, she got a doll quilt, she had to find a bed for it, so she had to shop for a little bit, she had to find a perfect bed that fit the doll quilt. So she so had a collection of both her doll quilts and her doll bed, and those were always up on the third floor. So if you haven't peeked around in the, the Mary Gordon reading room to see those, you really want to. Um, and, and, and I use Mary's collection as a way to kind of talk about our volunteers here at the museum because Mary was one of our first volunteers and, and many of the, the women who were really involved in the Lincoln Quilters Guild, in the Nebraska Quilt Project, which was the ultimately all the information that fed into the book Nebraska Quilts and Quilt Makers. Those were the people who are our staunch supporters from the very beginning and still are. And um, I like I like to laugh because like Mary was so funny because she was a volunteer and Mary was tiny, tiny little thing, and I always felt like I loomed over her. But such a force, and she didn't like to be told what to do, and she didn't like to be told she couldn't do something, and so I, we couldn't keep Mary off the ladders in the workroom. And today we can't put it, volunteers can't be on the ladders at all because of insurance. So that we find is no one, no volunteers on the ladders, but. When you would say that to Mary, she would just get that look and she'd be really stubborn about it. I could do it. And this is the one she's at 91 by now. I'm just saying, Mary, can you slow down a little for me? She doesn't like that. Um, she, I remember watching her while we were in the home economics building and there was a nasty snowstorm out and I was upset that Mary had been driven to the museum in the first place. And I said, Mary, just let me walk you to your car. 
no one. I was like, Mary, just let me do this. I do not know if she did not, that was not going to happen. So I watched her from the window because I was literally like, Mary is like a, a, a state treasure. If something happens to her on my watch, I am in so much trouble. <laughs> and um, I watched her, and she'd take a few steps, and she'd slip. And, <gasps> and then she'd make it, and then she'd take a few more steps, and she'd slide. Oh, it was just so horrible. And she made it her car. And eventually, uh, we, you know, we, we, we have to come up with a job for Mary that keeps her off the ladder. So if I said, you know what, Mary, with your expertise, we need you to identify all the patterns on the quilt by looking through Barbara Brackman's encyclopedia. We need those numbers on those quilts. And she came every Friday afternoon and sat then at the table because she, she had felt that that was a very worthwhile project for her to do. And she also entertained our guests because we always had visitors on Friday afternoon and they were always like, the Mary Gormley is taking me into the workroom. People knew her name from all over the world, so it was amazing. So, but Mary and the volunteers have been just an amazing force in my life because there's no better way to learn from someone and to grow with someone than when they show you that example of what it is to give really selflessly of your time and energy and your passion to something. And our volunteers, many of them have been here with me for 20 years and they still come and they're still here regularly. Some of you are out here tonight. Um, and that is just an amazing thing. And that has really shown me what, what having a real passion in your life can do for you in the long term and how satisfying it can make your life and how, how important it is to kind of live outside of your own self, I think is the best way to put it. You know, to be concerned with something other than yourself and commit to working hard for that's the success of that organization. And, you know, we have 80 volunteers. It is astounding when you start adding up the number of hours that are committed to the museum through our volunteer force. It's like having two or three more full-time people on staff easily. So it's, they, they've been amazing, and they really have been kind of a guiding light for me, as well as some of my dearest friends here at the museum. So I've been really lucky to have them. And I was going to tell one more story. And then we can just go live in the gallery. But the other is the Jane Ray Gore collection. And that is not one of our largest, but I really do feel like it's one of our most important, um, simply because Jane Ray Gore was one of the, the leaders in the quilt revival. So in the 1950s, she was producing articles for women's magazines on how to make quilts. And in the 1960s, she began publishing books. And one of her books was, I'm going to draw a blank on the title again, How to Do It All. I'm looking at Laura. It's the name of our show. Anyway, she really was a proponent. You can be a mother and a wife and do that really well, but you need to be an artist as well. Getting it all together. Getting it all together is what her book was called. And she really talked about how she wouldn't let the dishes sit in the sink because she needed time to do her artwork. Um, so, so she was like, she was like the first ten minutes, really. And if you see, if you go downstairs to see our political pop up tonight, which you do not want to miss when you are here today in the conservation workroom on the first floor, you'll see one of Jean Ray Moore's most controversial quilts. And you can see it, it; it's just her in a nutshell. Terrific sense of humor, a steely determination to to do well for women and to put women where they belong, which was everywhere they wanted to be, and and just a just a fun, shining example of a person. So, Jean Wentworth's collection came to us, it, like so many things have come to us, just randomly on a Monday morning. First thing on a Monday morning, I get a phone call. It's Jean's representative who was saying, you know, um, we have Jean Wentworth's collection. We have about 40 quilts, 45 quilts. We have all of her archives, her teaching materials, her samples, her letters, all this, all of this material, and we would like to give it to you all but there's one condition. There's a cart. You have to take the cart. And I was like, okay, great. How can we make this happen? And this woman was like, do you, don't you have to ask somebody or do something like official? And I said, like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll do, we'll, we'll do the official stuff. But yes, we want the collection, we'll take the cart, we'll take whatever you want us to take. Mm -hmm. And she kept saying, well, the, the cart, are you sure about the cart? It's not what you're doing. I was like, we will take everything because then, Jean Ray Lori had been here to speak. I knew who she was. I knew her background. So this is the most incredible gift we've ever been offered. I, I will, I will walk to California for Jean's clothes. I mean, I, I would. Um, so, you know, the process that we eventually did everything in 
under on the way, and my sister and I, my sister's archivist here on campus and cares for the quilts, research collection, and that special collections. So she came to pack the papers, I was packing the quilts, and we went to Jean's home and stayed there for two days and packed up her, her materials, met her daughter. Um, Jean was such a tease, you know, she doesn't even know us, and she kept teasing us about things. And Mary Ellen and I would look at each other like, is she teasing? Or is she serious? I mean, you just didn't know. And then she would just laugh at us because she thought we were so funny because we were trying to be so proper and good. So she really liked it that we could come in. We came in with boxes and our tape guns and all stuff. She said, what do you need? And we said, we've got it. We started setting up. She said, I don't like women who can use tools. And I was like, I love her. I love her. <laughs> um, it, it was amazing. Um, I just never forget sitting around that, that dining room table with her. I just never wanted to leave because she was so funny and so witty and smart and um, I think it would be the ultimate compliment um, when Liz, her daughter, was showing us how the, the final day, she said, you know, I feel like you're a part of our family now because you have all my mom's stuff and you're taking care of it and that means so much to me. And she said, and I've always wanted sisters and now I feel like I have two sisters. <laughs> so we still see Liz all the time and that collection and, and Jean's her voice here in the museum is something, you know, it sounds really cheesy and weird, you know, when you go downstairs and you're in the concert, in the storage, and you're amidst 6,000 quilts, and you're by yourself and it's quiet, it's like, you start thinking about those lives, and you start thinking about how when you make something and you stitch it, every stitch you're putting into it, you're thinking about, you know, your mind's on what's going on in your life. You're stitching through processes. You're stitching through grief and happiness and all that. And those emotions in that workroom are there. And you feel that really tangibly. And with Jean, I just feel like she was just like such a positive force that it's something that really means a lot to me to have her kind of along with us for this, this journey we set out on. So I, I, could, I just could not believe that we even had that opportunity. And that's was so wonderful. Um, I think one of the other things that makes me really proud um, is the, the fact that we've had a lot of people who donated to the center or worked with the center. They come back multiple times. And Lynn and Lynn are here tonight, and they've given to us two or three different times now from their family. And that, that is such an honor, because that shows that people understand the care that we put into our collection and that the, the passion we have for making that collection last for the long term and, and how important that is to us. I'm also really, really proud of the research that's been done here because the research that our students have done through our program, which is one of a kind, um, has really just taken the, the knowledge we have about quilts and quilt history and elevated it to a whole new level. And our students have done amazing work um, under the direction of Pat Cruz. Um, and so, the, the, the other part that I, I'm really, really excited about, and, and Jim and I were just talking about kind of new directions in quote research and quote history, is our international collection. And that was something that, you know, we didn't we hadn't even really thought about when, when the museum or the, the collection was first founded and, and brought here to Nebraska. And it was in 2004 when Patricia Stoddard, whose collection, we are just finalizing details on a gift of 200 um, Indian quilts to the museum. Um, so again, one of our, our long-term friends, um, Trish stopped in one day and said, I'd like to give you some quilts. And I was like, mm. you know, it was 2004. We didn't even know what we were doing with the collection. And then she had four Indian Raleigh's for us. And I said, Pat, what are these? And you know, Trish had written a book on Raleigh quilts. So she showed us this and we were so thrilled. But that started us thinking, well, if these are out there and we don't know about them, what else is out there in the world? And so in the last 10 years or so, the collection has just grown by leaps and bounds with pieces from all over the world. Um, it actually used to be a discussion Pat Cruz and I would often have, bless Pat's heart, she would get very, she'd be very black one. You know, she's a scientist. This is what we collect. We're not a textile museum, we are a quilt museum. We're gonna focus on that. We're gonna stay true to our mission. And I would say, but Pat, if we're gonna collect internationally, we have to kind of, we have to move beyond those scopes we set ourselves. Well, if it's not quilted, we can't have it. It's like, if you really look at it, the crazy world is not quilted. A lot of cabin world is not quilted. We have already gone past that. She's like, you're right, we have. And she would always be willing to listen. And even if she'd have her first reaction, she would always be willing to be, if you told her and explained to her well why something was important, she was always amenable to saying, you're right, I hadn't thought about it that way. 
I'm like, all right, let's do this. And so we really learned then that we had to expand the collection. And that's when we started getting into things like quilted clothing, wall hangings, pieces that weren't quilted, but were patchwork. And so to see the growth of the international side of the collection, I think is amazing. Um, the, the year we have coming up of exhibitions with our African quilts, with Indian quilts, um, quilts um, from Liberia, we are going to show some really amazing international collections um, this year. And it's really thrilling to see that that is something that is really <laughs> developed here. I think we are probably I, I know there are other collections that have international quotes, but I really do think that we truly have a, a market on that as a comprehensive collecting. You know, we collect very thinly across a really, really broad basis, and we're trying to embrace every area of the world. Um, a lot of that thanks to Bob James, who used to get in the cab, or whatever city he was in, whatever country, and ask that cab driver, what did you sleep under? What kind of blankets did you have? What did you have to do? We learned very quickly, you don't ask people about quilts, you ask them about patchwork. Um, so, you know, it's just been an incredible journey, and um, I can't believe it's been 20 years and that I've had this opportunity. I can remember very clearly thinking when my poor mom was saying, you know, what are you going to do with that art history degree? You know, wouldn't we all say that to our children? You know, what? Art history. And um, I, I remember thinking about that, and I said, you know, I want a job where I to go out and talk to people, where I get to travel, where I get to work with quilts, right? I mean, all these factors that I had in my head, and that's exactly what my job has ended up being, but more than I can ever imagine. And so the, the quilts have taken me around the world. They have brought me so many wonderful relationships, so many incredible experiences, and there's so many more that I could tell you about that I could put into this tiny little exhibit. But um, it still is really a lovely, lovely opportunity. There are a few pieces in the gallery that are just there because there's something I really respond to. The latest is our piece called Indigenous Opulence. It was made by a young woman named Adele Phillips, who's an actual graduate of our department. She lives out in California now, and this is just one of our, our donation offers that comes in through our website. And we get lots and lots of donation offers. And it's like a milkweed quilt. I don't know. That's when I go to our acquisition committee members and say, well, what do you think? But it was so beautifully designed and so thoughtfully made and it's so central to Nebraska that it was, yeah, I think that'd be cool for us. But then I met Adele when she brought it in and it was just so fascinating to talk to her and how to, to see how she related to Nebraska, to milkweed of all things that is a weed here in Nebraska that we've played with. And, I think we made Christmas ornaments when I was a kid with the milkweed pods and brick brack and all that. But, but she, it, it just made me so proud. I mean, I, I'm so proud of my Nebraska roots. I love Nebraska. I love the plains. I like being out of the city, the sea forever. It, it's always been something that's called to me when I've lived other places. And, and, and Adele talking about how she took something that was so central to Nebraska, something that was so common to Nebraska, and then by, by putting it into the quilt, by using the fabrics that she did and the stitching that she did, she really elevated it to something of just such beauty. And I just love that. And I love how passionate she was about that. And to me, that's just kind of Nebraska right there. So, so I think something was very, very new to the collection that I just absolutely love. And um, I love the way it floats in the middle of the gallery there. Um, it could have been Hummus Pose. If we really wanted to, it's actually very lightweight, but we were really concerned about gravity on that really fine fabric, so it's, it's laid flat. Um, so, how do I wrap up this? Um, in the gallery? In the gallery. So, yeah, why don't we, if you don't mind, um, we'll take maybe a couple questions, and then I can go ahead and talk to you more about individual pieces or answer questions. Um, I just want to thank you. This really is an indulgence, and I feel very, very lucky to have this amazing career I've had. And then to be spoiled rotten by having an opportunity to just stand up here and talk about it. It's, it's absolutely lovely. So, so you have a question. what was the Jean Ray Lowry cart? It's in the exhibit. It's in the exhibit. You'll see it. That's why it's, it was not very clean. And when we got it out to show, we were like, mm hmm. And I kind of like, like twice the exhibitions were at the exhibit. Do we really need to have it? I said, yes, yes. The cart must go to the show. Because that's the, the story to me. So you'll see. It's actually, um, it was a, a birthday gift to Jean. I don't know which birthday it was, 1979, I believe. And off 
they put out a call to her friends to make birthday cards for her that are about eight inches square, and they were delivered in the cart. So the cart was part of the birthday present. And there's a Michael James, little Michael James quilt, and there's also a Lincoln Quilters Guild little birthday card. That were, if anybody knows anything about the Lincoln Quilters Guild card, we're already, there's already a this conversation. We want to know if they're really nuns. They look like nuns, at least they're veiled women. We're trying to figure out what, what was the significance to the Lincoln Quilters Guild giving Jean that piece. Pat, you know? I'll, I'll check it, make sure I can see. I knew somebody would know, but anyway. So that was just who we found that when we were over the Lincoln Quilters Guild exhibition. Yes? Oh, the future. Gosh, I don't know. Um, the building actually was an amazing process. It was something that I was always like, ah, don't, don't you think we need a building, Bob? Uh, and he, but Bob early on was like, no, I want all my funds to go to acquisitions. I wanted to go to building the collection, and that was his focus. And so we, we did a lot of work on that. And he knew we needed a building. He just didn't want to be the one to do it. And we kept talking, and the collection had grown so much that we were literally bursting at the seams in the other building, and in fact, having to do some off site storage. And I said, you know what, it's about almost 10 years. And I, I swear, I'm Pat was here, she, she might back me up, but I just keep saying, you know, by 10 years, Pat, by 10 years, I bet we're going to have a building. Because our collection was so amazing. Like, we have to have a place where we can show our quotes. We showed something on campus at all times. So we had quilts at the in, in, um, Robert Hill's Big Gallery. We had quilts at Morrill Hall. We had quilts at the Sheldon. So you could see something from the collection. But we really needed the space. So ultimately, um, as we approached our 10 years, the Jameses decided that they would host a contest and um, ask uh, architecture firms to submit designs for the building. There's a lot of controversy first about where the building was going to be placed. Was it going to be here or was it going to be kind of behind the dental college? I was like, please, well, please give us the stream address. Because I spent 10 years trying to explain to people how to find our building on campus with no street address. It's like, well, you go here, you take a look there, then you take a right. It was ridiculous. So I was really, really excited we chose this spot. Um, so about 120 different architecture firms submitted a uh, of letters saying they were interested in the project. Out of those, three people were chosen to actually design a building. We had gone through the process of what they call programming each room. So you say, we need this many plugs, we need these kind of lights, we need these kind of temperature and humidity controls. We give them all this information. And then um, we had a grand week event where three different architects came in and showed us their designs and explained what they, you know, their, their thinking behind it. Daniel Leapskin was one, Robert William Stern, who designed our building, and the other was a Japanese designer, and I cannot remember his name for the life of me. But they all, I will say the Japanese designer designed his with a, a beer garden on the roof, which I really love. Yeah, that didn't go. Um, he wanted shingles, though, for the exterior, and none of us could get past the idea. You know how shingles look in Nebraska after a couple of years? No, no shingles. Uh, anyway, so um, there was a, a committee and they determined that Robert Stern's design was what they wanted to go with. And I think part of it was because he paid such incredible detail to tying the building into a quilt form. So the glass front here is the quilt top. The panels that you see, the frosted panels, are kind of the quilting stitch that goes through the quilt. We're sitting in the eye of the needle here in the reception hall. If you look at the floors and the brickwork and the designs, everything is quilt oriented, and I think that everybody loved that. But I have to say, what I think everybody just kind of went, oh, when he was talking about, he talked about the great lawn and the piece of campus and the view from here. And it was so cool because he just, he just couldn't get over all that green space, and he really wanted that green space to be brought into the museum in essence. So that's what we have this glass pane. And it was so funny, but then I went to New York City one time, and we went to his office to chat about something, and it was like, in the entire neighborhood, realm in New York City, outside of this building, there was like this one tiny little spindly tree trying to grow with the rest of the cement, and I was like, no wonder he likes our great lawn of East Campus. He didn't tell me I actually had a different name for it, but that's what he talked about. So. When he started talking about that, you could kind of see people get stars in their eyes and kind of knew which design was going to win. 
So anyway, um, enough. I could talk all night. Any other questions before we go into the gallery for a quick few minutes and you can some water and ask questions? We'll talk about 45 minutes, right? Are there words on this quilt? It's actually stitched in the quilt and it's kind of hard to read. Um, I was saying to the, the group this morning, I think that was kind of part of Adele's design, that the, the text actually forms part of the design of the surface. But yes, it says indigenous opulence, actually, in the text. Well, let's walk right in, and then you can stay, you can enjoy the evening, enjoy the other galleries, whatever you would like, and I'll be happy to take more questions.